gentlemen, on, be on behalf of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, let me warmly welcome you to today's webinar, which will be on constipation and incontinence, which are very challenging problems encountered by gastroenterologists. The topic will be presented by Professor Nandadeva Samarsekara, who is no stranger to this audience. Professor Nandadeva Samarsekara is the Senior Professor and Chair of Surgery of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. In addition, he is Chairman of the Board of Study in Surgery and a member of the Board of Management of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. He is also the current Vice President of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka and has been a past president of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology. He also serves as a patron of the Sri Lanka Society of Colorectal Surgeons. Without further ado, over to you, Professor Nandadeva Samarasekar. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeeva, for that kind introduction. And I must thank the President and the Council of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology for giving me this opportunity to present my lecture today. Now, actually, it is mainly, can you all see my screen, please? Not yet, okay, sir. Okay. Now? It's coming. Is it coming? Uh, not yet. Right, right, sir. Can see, is it? Yes. Okay, right. So I'll yeah, you continue. Need to go to the slide view. Fine. Fine, so, so we can see. We can see. Tonic, actually, what we are speaking about today is not just actually constipation it's a chronic what we call the functional constipation which is of course a condition that has been neglected by most of the physicians and the surgeons because they have not identified what it is so first of all let me just tell you a brief very simple way to tell you what how the defecation occurs Generally, what I always tell the students is that, you know, you don't think of defecation, urination, walking, breathing when you are young. But as you grow older, then only these problems start coming and then only you start thinking. So I always tell them when you are young, just enjoy the, your physiological mechanisms. And because there will be a day where you will be really struggling with these. So I have come to a stage where now I'm experiencing difficulties in various physiological functions. And I now think I was, I wish I was 25, 30 years old. Now, what we do is when we go to the toilet, we generally sit on the commode or sit uh, on the squatting plate where you take a deep breath, which will contract your diaphragm. And then you can you strain by tightening your abdominal muscles. And then your levator, the puborectal is relaxes, allowing this acute angle to become more obtuse. And then your sphincters relax and you defecate. And you don't, you don't even think of these things because it just happens. But let me that tell you that this is what basically happens. But this process involves not only your abdomen, but it has an input from your brain spinal cord as well. That's why people with smile, spinal cord lesions or dementia, depression, they all have problems with your defecation. Now, there is this criteria which have evolved throughout the time, which are called Rome criteria. Now, Rome 4 criteria also have come in to define what chronic functional constipation or functional constipation is. And most of these things are subjective, but there are some objective ones also. So what they say is, if you have two or more of the following symptoms lasting for more than three months, this, is, this could possibly be a functional constipation, case of functional constipation. 
that is less than three bowel movements per week. Because you know, from infancy, when you come up, when you grow older, your bowel frequency becomes less. I mean, as an infant or neonate, you may be having about five, six bowel motions a day, but by the time you become, become an adolescent and an adult, you generally go once or twice a day. But there are people who go three times a day or sometimes four times a day, but that is the norm. That's very few people who are in the right or left extremes of the Gaussian curve. And also this is training during at least 25% of bowel movements. Now these are all actually more subjective. The second one, the third one, fourth one, fifth one, they are all more subjective symptoms, but the first and the last are more objective because you have to ask the patient when they go to the toilet, unless you ask, they won't tell you. Because these people with functional constipation, they use various manual maneuvers. A lot of them put their finger into the rectum and pull the stools out. Others support the pelvic flow when they are straining because sometimes they have got a, what we call a pelvic descent. The whole pelvic flow is uh, loose, lax, and it comes out. And so they can't push the fecal matter out unless they push the perin support the perineum. So as a doctor, you have to ask them specifically, or sometimes they, if they have a rectal seal, uh, they have to put the finger into the vagina and push the posterior wall of the vagina backwards for them to, for the stools to come out. And unless you ask specifically, they won't tell you this because they think that you might interpret it as that they are perverts putting fingers into orifices. And one patient actually came and told me that when I asked these things, uh, he said, no doctor, I was a little bit shamed of myself because uh, one doctor just laughed at me when I told him that, you know, I have to put my finger into the vagina to push the stools out. So therefore, and also don't, when patients tell you about their symptoms, don't laugh or have any cynical smiles on your face because they think that, you know, the, they, they think that they are perverts. So therefore, please remember Ask the patient, seriously, do you have these symptoms? And they will tell you yes or no. And then you know they have got some functional constipation. Now, generally, we say acute constipation is something that is less than three months. And any patient above the age of 45, I would say, coming with constipation of less than three months, always think of something mechanical. Not that the chronic constipation, functional constipation, the patient also can start at, within that three months, but generally older the person coming with a short duration constipation, always think of either a stricture or a neoplasm or even fecal impaction. But if it is more than three months, generally, generally, I would say, it is more likely to be a functional constipation, especially if the patient is young. Now, the functional constipation, we generally divide it into two sections. One is the slow colonic transit or slow transit constipation. The next one is a dyssynergic defecation or what we call obstructive defecation. Now, if you Think about your pelvic flow. It is a dome-shaped sort of musculature. And this has got a lot of function that supports your perineum and that also can undergo spasticity or even that which may cause various other symptoms. That is, I mean, pelvic flow disorders is a subject itself. And if you go through the literature, you will see, I mean, there are so many pelvic flow disorders and this is only one of them. And also, if you take the 
uh, pelvic flow please remember it gives disorders of the pelvic flow gives rise to many condition not only uh, 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 gi symptoms it can lead to urological symptoms with urological incontinence it can give rise to sexual problems regarding your ejaculation for a male dyspareunia in females so it is a sort of a combined effect and all these patients who come with chronic constipation always ask about their the sexual and the uh, urological problems also because if you just attend to one you'll end up with problems in the other or worsening the other we are i have seen patients who have had constipation and they also have had the vaginal wall prolapse or uh, uh, uterine vaginal prolapse ur uh, urinary incontinence and the gynecologist has gone and done uh, hysterectomy only or colpopexy or wh whatever their operations and their constipation has got worse so you have to attend to all three problems at the same time if they have so let's take what you mean by slow transit constipation that means the fecal matter that comes into the cecum takes a long time to come to the rectum i mean it's a very slow transit that's why we call it call it slow transit constipation so main culprits are endocrine causes maybe hypothyroidism hypercalcemia addisons pregnancy these are all actually causes of slow transit and remember any patient coming with symptoms suggestive of chronic constipation i would suggest that you do at least a tsh serum calcium and a fasting blood sugar or hba1c to exclude diabetes your diabetes is a well known condition that causes autonomic neuropathy of the gut this is the first presentation may be con uh, constipation i mean not very many i mean i if i have seen 100 patients maybe one would have had hypercalcemia and maybe about 10 would have had hypothyroidism so therefore these were not diagnosed the first presentation may be the constipation so just have a few screening blood tests for these patients who come with chronic constipation which is suggestive of functional constipation then also patients are on medication please remember unlike those days now lots of patients are on hundreds of drugs so most of the time it is the medications that cause this constipation slow transit not really any other pathology and if you don't ask i have seen several patients being investigated extensively with sigmoidoscopy colonoscopy barium enema ct scans dynamic pelvic mri why because they had chronic constipation but they were on calcium channel blockers and sometimes they are depressed they are on tricyclic antidepressants they won't tell you people with mental disorders will never tell you that they are taking tricyclic antidepressants unless the partner or whoever who accompanies them says no no she has got depression she is on this so remember lots and lots and lots of patients are on antidepressants so it's a good history that will tell you that further extensive investigations are not necessary it may be neurological causes diabetic neuropathy heavy metal now these are actually what are in textbooks but you hardly see in this country lead intoxication but diabetes multiple sclerosis parkinson's disease very common and spinal cord injuries frontal lobe tumors may present with personality disorders and constipation and we get so many patients who have a spinal cord injuries we are we get referrals from the neurosurgery unit they are packed with fecal matter because they have no sensation their spinal cord reflexes are not working they don't feel that their 
getting fecally impacted and sometimes the first uh, referral is for stercoral perforation. Now, what about the pelvic flow problems? I mean, what we call dyssynergic defecation or obstructed defecation. There, can, there may be an anatomical obstruction. Anatomical means, we'll show you a few slides later on. Patient may have an internal intersusception. We, that means beginning of a rectal prolapse. You are having the upper rectum prolapsing into the middle rectum. And that is how your rectal prolapse begins. Prolapse begins. So, or maybe a rectocele, especially women who have had several vaginal childbirths may have a rectocele where when you strain to defecate, your fecal matter go into the rectocele. And that they are the people who will put the finger into the vagina and push it backwards so that the fecal matter would fall down. And they won't tell you again unless you ask. But if you look at most of these people, when you examine the perineum, examination of the perineum is very important and get them to strain. You might even see the perineum sort of prolapsing down below your ischial tuberosities. So you know definitely this defecation. Then you have got a, what you call a functional obstruction. The other, one above was anatomical. There was an anatomical part obstructing your defecation. Then you have got a functional part. That is, we know our in the pelvic flow, we have got several muscles. Puborectalis is one of them. And that puborectalis forms a sling around the anorectal junction. And it, when it contracts, your anorectal junction becomes more acute. I'll show you in some slides later on and some radiological investigations also. And then the stools won't come into the uh, rectum. Whereas when you want to defecate, you relax. That's an involuntary procedure that occurs. And then your anorectal junction becomes more obtuse. It's usually when it's contracted, it's 90 degrees or less. But when you relax it, it becomes more straightened and the fecal matter come into the rectum and you get the sensation of fecal matter when your rectoanal reflex starts, what we call RAIR, which will sample the material that are there in the upper anus, which will tell you whether it's feces, flatus or liquid. And then when the place and time are suitable, you go to the washroom and empty yourself. So, but there is a condition called paradoxical contraction of puborectalis. That is, they go to the toilet and then they strain. Normally, the puborectalis should relax, but the puborectalis paradoxically contracts some more. And then it, that angle becomes more acute and the patients can't defecate. Then we have got congenital hypertrophy of the internal sphincter, which is an extremely, extremely rare. In my entire career, I have seen only one. And then we have got that also, we diagnosed it when we did the rectal examination. It is a very tight anus. And we did the ultrasound and the internal sphincter thickness, if I'm not mistaken, about six millimeters. And he was... Uh, put on initially nifedipine for which he uh, responded and later he had a partial lateral sphincterotomy and he's fine now. The, then you have got this perineal descent and that is when you strain in a normal person, your perineal, the, your pelvic flow should contract and support the perineum, the pelvic organs. But in this case, the entire thing drops down. Then, as I told you earlier, if you are thinking of a dyssynergic or obstructed defecation, always ask for urological and sexual dysfunction also. Otherwise, you go and treat one, the other one will get worse. Or you may have to do a combined operation 
with the hope of treating both with the urologist, gynecologist, and the coloproctologist. Now, this is what I mean by puborectalis. Now, puborectalis normally is contracted because it is a sling going around the anorectal junction and getting attached to the pubis. Now, in this case, you can see it is contracted. It has caused sort of narrowing of the anorectal junction. And in this case, when it, it is relaxed, so that it becomes, it gets open, the anorectal junction and the fecal matter come down. In the paradoxical contraction, what happens is when they start straining, this pulls it some more anteriorly. So your angle becomes rather than obtuse, a very acute angle and patients can't pass stool. Now, how would you investigate? Please make sure, ask the patient what they mean by constipation. For different people, constipation is different. You will be amazed if you ask what you really mean by constipation, the answers they give you. So ask about the frequency, whether they have to strain, whether they put their fingers and pull it out, and whether they have to support the perineum, and ask, are you on any treatment for any thyroid problems? And until you ask, they won't tell you. They say, ah, yes, doctor, I am on uh, thyroxine. And, but they think that it has nothing to do with their symptoms because these are new symptoms. They have had a thyroidectomy done long time ago because when they tell these things, you observe the patient. Sometimes you see the scar on the neck. So as a doctor, not only the ears, your eyes also have to work. And then you immediately know the patient has had a thyroidectomy. And then you ask, are you on thyroxy? Ah, no, doctor, I, finished, I stopped it after about uh, 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 three months after the surgery because the test was normal. Now she is grossly hypothyroid. So please remember. So ask about the endocrine disturbance. Main thing is actually, if it's an older patient, please ask about symptoms suggestive of colorectal carcinoma because I have seen a few patients who have been just, I mean, over 50 years treated with laxatives and coming now with advanced rectal cancer. So in the back of your mind, please have carcinoma because if you miss it, you have killed the patient. I mean, missing a this synergic defecation, you are not going to kill the patient. It will be a bit uncomfortable. Patient will suffer, but patient is not, you are not going to kill him or her. But you miss a colorectal carcinoma. It's really tragic because that would have been a totally curable condition, early carcinoma, and you have made it an advanced carcinoma. Then a lot of people don't ask anything about medications. I mean, Please ask about medical medic, medication that they are on. I have seen only very few even writing a history, a brief history for any patient. So if you don't write a history, remember next time when the patient comes to see you, you don't know what you have. Just, you are just looking at the medications that were given. Take a minute or two to write a small history, especially I these days they are on anticoagulants. And I have seen some people coming from some peripheral hospitals where they have had polypectomies while they were on warfarin. Well, patient doesn't know. Some of the patients would tell you, Ar sudhu paata polypetta, ar kaha paata petta. That is how they get to know. So just ask them, bring the tablets and come or the prescription that the doctor gave you because you are heading for disaster one of, the, one of these days, if you do any invasive procedures on a patient on high doses of warfarin, right? Then <coughs> pregnancy, sexual and urological functions. Pregnancy is something that causes constipation. Almost all people who have been pregnant probably have experienced this. And Sexual abuse 
is another thing that triggers off functional constipation. And these things, whether it's male or female, you will have to, I mean, you may have to have a suspicion the way they speak. And when you examine, when you see the anus or the vagina, you know something is wrong. And he, he or she may need psychological support as well because they cannot tell anything and then they come with these other symptoms. So you'll have to do a little bit of forensic work also when you are doing coloproctology. Now, exclude psychological causes, especially, it's not psychiatric, I'm not telling about psychiatric, but children and teenagers have a lot of psychological problems now. Drug abuse, the uh, physically, sexually, psychologically, at home, at school, on the playground, and teenagers, especially, they come with various things, but they can't tell it in front of their parents. So sometimes you may have to have the nurse and send the parents out saying that yeah, you would like to ask some personal questions and question them. Some of them come out with various unbelievable I mean, incidents that have happened to them or happening. Then psychiatric illnesses, please remember, constipation may be the presenting feature of depression. And, and also patients who are having psychiatric illnesses with constipation will not tell you because they think, uh, I mean, it's, it's not proper to tell the doctor that they have got a psychiatric problem. And, the, and then the doctor might think that anime pisek ne, me me avilati ne. So therefore they, they may not tell you unless you develop some confidence. So you have to speak to them and ask them about psychiatric illnesses. Old people living in homes, and especially we see this problem in the West. Sometimes they live up to 90, 95, and they are all alone in, in a room inside a house, and they are depressed, and they are demented. As I told you, for the defecatory process, you need the brain also, and the spine, and the spinal reflexes and the local mucosal reflexes, all that. So these things uh, do not work in patients who are demented. But more than anything, a good clinical examination, including a rectal examination is mandatory. Please put your finger into the anus you will be able to see whether it's a very patulous anus or whether it's an anus with very tight sphincter tone, which may suggest either some painful condition or congenital hypertrophy. If it is very patulous, it may be sphincter damage or it may be abuse or it may be pudendal nerve neuropathy. So therefore, it is very important that you examine the rectum with a rectal exam with your finger. Now, how do you investigate a patient in chronic constipation? You have to, basic investigations are sigmoidoscopy, they are necessary colonoscopy in an older person, a barium enema to exclude the megacolon sometimes. And please remember, I have seen patients who have had Barium menema, then they are not really, then they go for sigmoidoscopy and the same surgeon or the physician does colonoscopy also. And three different tests at different times. Patient pays for these things. They are not cheap. So always please think if you are the patient, it's unnecessary test. You could have done just a barium menema at the very beginning. If you think the patient uh, cannot afford, and then you'd have got your information. Then if you suspect slow transit constipation, at least you are fasting blood sugar, calcium levels, TSH, before you start investigating. And then you can do what we call a measurement of colon transit time. And what we do is in a very crude country, they have got specific different markers 
but we don't get this. I think Ragama used to have. I don't know whether they have it now. Sanjeeva, do you all do colon transit at Ragama now? Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm actually in Kaluvoil, sir. Now. Uh, ah, right. Sorry. During that time, of course, uh, Prof. Shunik still uh, was doing it. So that's about so six years ago. They used to have. I used to get down those packs from Ragama. I don't know if they have it now. I don't think you can import any, but I do a very rough way of doing it. I just take 20 metal pellets, which are they are in this nasogastric tubes. At the tip, you get three lead, not lead, uh, non-reactive uh, metal balls. And I take 20 of those and put the empty two amoxicillin capsules after asking them whether they're allergic to ampicillin or penicillin and put it into that and get them to swallow that and then i take two x-rays on the second day and the seventh day i'll show you some x-rays and you will know what i mean and on the seventh day if you have 20 percent or more of what you have swallowed then that means you have got some degree of slow transit constipation that is four or more of the pellets that you have swallowed if they are still remaining in the bowel then you know that it is uh, slow transit then if you are suspecting obstructed defecation, that is something blocking your outlet, we discussed those cases before, we can do what you call an evacuation proctogram. That is you put a paste into your rectum and you get the patient to sit on a radio loosened commode and, get, and there'll be x-rays going through your commode and the lower rectum and the anus and the pelvis and you will see whether you get these conditions like internal intersusception and pelvic flow descent and rectocele. I'll show you some pictures later but unfortunately this can't get these. So we have got the anorectal manometry which might suggest a very high internal anal sphincter pressure and then you do the ultrasound and also we can do the balloon expulsion test. That is, you put a balloon into the uh, rectum and you inflate it with 50 ml of water and get them to expel it within a minute, 40 seconds to minute. And then if they can't do that, we know there is something wrong. Then you can do endoanal ultrasound, which is available, but unfortunately our ultrasound probe also broke down. And now no import, so we have to wait till things settle down. Or you can do what you call a dynamic pelvic MRI. That is, patient is on the table. You put a gel into the rectum and get the patient to defecate and see this. But remember, you are trying to defecate in a very uncomfortable, unusual position. Lying supine, trying to defecate. I mean, it's not the proper way of assessing, but the radiologist will be able to show internal intersusceptions, rectoceles, and the perineal descending perineum syndrome. Now, in acute constipation, less than three months, you will be able to see some abnormality when you do a barium enema, sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, which I think is mandatory to exclude a mechanical obstruction. Please remember, patient will not die of functional constipation, but they will die of carcinoma. Now, this is a colon transit study, which we have done. We have given them 20 of these pellets. On the second day, you take the X-ray. You can see all the 20 pellets, pellets inside. The, now, these are fecolids inside the bowel, which are dispersed from the right colon, transverse colon, splenic flexure coming down into the sigmoid. So that is the second day. Then on the seventh day, all are gone. So you know, if they had gone to the toilet three times a week during that time, or even twice a week, if the patient has pushed out everything that was in the bowel, the chances are that there is reasonable transit in the 
uh, large power. So you don't have to worry much. You can probably, if you have excluded any other sinister symptoms, stop them on a mild laxative. Now, this is a patient who took the pellets, but on the seventh day, uh, then you can see the dispersion of the markers again throughout the colon. We know that this patient has got slow transit because almost all the pellets, if you count, all the 20 probably are there. Now, this is a patient on the seventh day, you can see all the pellets markers are in the rectum and the sigmoid. So, you know, mostly these in the upper rectum, we know this patient has got some evacuatory problem. This patient has got obstructed defecation and you can see all of, almost all of them are concentrated in the rectum. Now, this is a patient who is having a defecation proctography. There is contrast media inside the, and the patient starts to defecate and you can see an anterior small rectocel now appearing, which becomes much more, the moment they strain more, you can see the a large rectocel where all the fecal matter go into that. That's how patients by trial and error, they find that if they put the finger into the vagina from here and push this backwards, the fecal matter will fall down. So they have got a large rectocele. But remember, having a rectocele is not always a cause for the functional uh, obstructed defecation. If you take 100 women above the age of 50 who have had childbirth, at least 50% of them will have a small rectocele. So don't refer, jump and refer them to the gynecologist. They'll very gladly take them and they will just cobble up the thing and they will make the constipation worse. So just seeing a rectocele on your contrast study doesn't mean that is the cause. But if it's a very large rectocele, most likely, and also the patient telling that I feel that when I strain, that my vagina gets filled up, and then I put the finger and I see this bulge, and I push it backwards, and then I, the fecal matter fall, and that's how I'm defecating. Probably that is the reason for her functional constipation. Now again, evacuation or defecation proctogram showing an internal intersusception. Now, we have put dye or contrast into the rectum. Patient is sitting on a commode and straining, and you can see the intersusception beginning. The upper rectum is intersuscepting into the lower middle and the lower rectum. And this will, with time, come down and plug the anus. So the moment you start straining, your anal opening gets closed up because this intersusception susceptum has come down and then they find it difficult to pass stool. Then what they do is they put their finger into the rectum where they feel some mass there and they pull out the fecal matter. So they are, I think, at St. Mark's Hospital are called scoopers. So they, they become scoopers because you have to ask them, do you do this? And invariably they'll come up and say, yes, I do that. Because I feel there's a lump coming and getting stuck at my anus. And I have had two or three patients who have come and uh, told me that they had to undergo rectopexy. Now, treatment. Please remember, most patients need only correct dietary advice and toilet training especially children, because the children, unless you train them, they have very erratic bowel habits because they sometimes they get up late in the morning and there is no time to go to the toilet. They suppress the desire to go to the toilet and it becomes a habit and then they get fecally impacted. And therefore, 
most of the time you only have to advise the mothers and the fathers make sure that if they are getting up early, they, they don't get up early then let them go to the toilet in the evening or before going to bed in the night but make it a habit then once you make it a habit it happens if it if you don't make it a habit then they suppress the the desire to defecate they end up with fecal impaction so what are the treatment modalities available to treat functional constipation medical treatment we'll come to that surgical treatment especially for a rectocele or intractable uh, slow transit where we may do a colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis i have done it for two patients unfortunately i had the pictures of that rectum and the colon and the fecal bolus which is actually bigger than the uh, rugger ball and uh, i i was unable to trace it it's in one of my computers in the database somewhere but in the future data i'll show you that it's amazing I and mean, you can't believe and lot of people have been giving laxatives ultrasounds nobody put a finger into the rectum i'm not blaming because sometimes the uh, especially i would say sanjeeva the physicians never do a rectal examination even gastroenterologists if they put the finger in they would have found this rugger ball inside the rectum which needs surgery i mean there is no there was no way that you could empty it because it was a rock hard rugby ball inside the rectum and the entire rectum was atonic it was not contracting and this was a young fellow i this 17 or 18 year old then comes what we call biofeedback therapy that is usually used for people who are having paradoxical contraction of the puborectalis i have been fortunate enough to see this at the st marks when i was there as a trainee earlier they long time ago this was and there is a special device i'll show you that and i'll tell you how uh, it works then the new kid on the block is what we call the sacral nerve stimulation and that is you put an electrode like a pacemaker you put a small pacemaker into the the uh, sac s3 2 3 sacral foramina and stimulate the sacral nerve and that is supposed to improve your functional constipation and the mechanism is still not very well known but they think that it improves the perception of the material in the rectum but these things need some more assessment with time now medical treatment is mainly reassurance change in lifestyle tell them about the toilet you ask 100 patients coming with hemorrhoids rectal constipation are you a person who is looking at your computer tab or the mobile phone at in the toilet 90 out of 100 will say yes we have come to an era where the phone has become your brain part of your body you can see people crossing the road while looking at it you go to a country like japan 99.9 of them are glued to their mobile or the tab they cross the road while looking at that but nothing happens to them because they are very law abiding citizens all the vehicles stop when it is red in sri lanka of course most of them get knocked down but they are glued to the tv or to the tab or the phone please remember for your defecatory process you need the higher centers your brain your spinal cord your spinal nerves your mucosal or submucosal myosinous plexuses rectoanal inhibitory reflexes they are all necessary without that you can't defecate so you take off the top influence then with time you become constipated i mean it's good business for us actually most of these patients who come with hemorrhoids are glued to the tv or they are glued to the tab and the mobile 
and the wife or the husbands always say, Ayo, yes, doctor, he spends about one and a half hours inside the toilet and the husband's excuse is, that is the only time that I have freedom to do my work and that I can really go through my office work. So you are going through your office work, you are not doing your defecation. So therefore, 10 to 15 minutes max in the toilet. So you always tell them, if your son or daughter is going there and saying, you remove the door lock and open it. So, because that is going to be a very bad habit, they will invariably end up with problems. Eye problems, GIT problems. Then, the diet. Increase the fiber and the fluid intake. Now, it's a fashion. When we were small, actually, we never brought food from outside. It was always cooked at home. There was always smell loom. So, now, Husband and wife both work. So to keep the home fires burning, they have to bring food from outside, Kushmi. And what are they? It's always hoppers or some curry and not a proper diet. So therefore, you must tell them this won't do. When you take this diet, your children will also take the same diet. So therefore, make sure that you in introduce some leafy vegetables into your meals. Because every single day we had leafy vegetables at home. We never, and we were forced to eat. I know some of my brothers got even assaulted by my father not for not eating leafy vegetables. Malung was a must. So therefore, make sure that they are the cheapest. Then laxatives. You can start off, if you have extruded all other uh, high-risk uh, conditions, and you can give them some bulk purgatives or non-absorbable sugars, magnesium. There's a whole array of laxatives that are available. So generally, no point in starting them with a mild laxative. Please remember, they won't work. These are chronic constipators. If you put a finger in and if you feel hard feces, give them a good dose of clean prep to get rid of all their uh, fecal matter in the bowel first and then put them on a regular dose of maybe half a sachet of uh, polyethylene, polyethylene glycol every other day like or to keep the bowel moving. So please make sure that you first get rid of all the muck in the gut before you start them on a milder purgatives. Then prokinetic agents, the, again the latest would be procalopride and lubiprostone. Procalopride is available, I don't know about lubiprostone, whether they are available here. You may try those and any mass and suppositories as well. Maybe a combined management, not just one aspect. You may have to do two or three of these at the beginning. And once the bowel gets used to the having a good motion, you can change it. Now, what is the surgical treatment? Very, very rarely indicated because you only have to repair maybe a rectal intersusception or rectal rectoseal. Then, in very resistant cases of uh, uh, very resistant cases of uh, constipation, you may have to do a colectomy and an ileorectal anastomosis. Now, I have done this for about five patients in the past. Four are doing very well, but one went the other way. They couldn't con he couldn't control the fecal matter because I completely forgot that this was a pretty old person and their sphincters are not perfect and had a massive incontinence and had to end up with a proctectomy and a permanent ileostomy. So before you do a colectomy and an ileorectal anastomosis, 
please assess the rectal function, especially if the patient is very old. Because hard stools, they can retain. Liquid stools, they can't. It's like doing a pouch for a... We regularly do, used to do those taste pouches, but now medical gastroenterologists are managing them very well. We have got an excellent gastroenterologist in the unit. And I think for the last four years, I have done only two pouches. Those days, every month we used to do a pouch. So therefore, it's like doing a pouch. Your stools are liquid. If we have liquids, if the patient has liquid stools, you had it. Then biofeedback therapy that I told you about paradoxical contraction of the puborectalis. It's also called anismus sometimes, paradoxical contraction. Various names are there. This actually trains the patient to relax the pelvic flow on straining. Because the patient, not that he or she is doing it voluntarily, but it happens. It never happened before. Why it starts later on, nobody knows. They keep tightening the anorectal junction, preventing the anorectal angle from becoming obtuse. Now that is a device. There are more expensive modern devices, but this is a device that we used to use at the St. Mark's where you have got a probe. Now, let me just tell you, regard, now urination, you can tell a person how to urinate. You can show how to urinate. You can show how to scratch your ear. You can show how to wash your face. You can show how to wash your backside, but you can't show them how to relax the puborectalis. So how do you do that? So that is where this device comes into play. The patient is, there is a rectal probe here. Patient is told to shove this inside the rectum, anus into the lower rectum. And this device, has got diodes which light up according to the pressure that is in the anus. So the moment you put it, it might show a pressure of 90. Now you tell the patient, bring the, you do whatever the maneuver, you try to bring it down towards 10 by straining. So they strain, and then suddenly you find the 90 becomes 100 or 100. So tell them, no, 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 no. You must do the a maneuver which will bring this value closer to zero. After about half an hour to 45 minutes, they learn how to relax the pelvic. The initial they were contracting. So you tell them, you practice this for half an hour twice a day for about six weeks. And the patients are allowed to go home with this device, practice, but at the same time, you give them some laxatives as well. And you allow them to practice this relaxation of the pelvic flow. And of course, if you wish, you can even have music. You can see the music there. While this is inside your anus, you can play music, right? So now there are more sophisticated one. This probably was something I saw in 1990s. Then, as I told you, the new kid on the block is sacral nerve stimulation, where there is constant stimulation of the sacral nerve roots with very low voltage current, which is implanted into your sacral foramina. This may, they think it may assist by increasing the rectal apparent sensation, but Definite action is uncertain. And this is like a pacemaker. You initially put a temporary stimulator and see whether there is improvement. If so, you implant a more permanent one. Now these can be recharged. The batteries can be recharged. You sit on a charger, which will recharge the, the 
the battery and they keep on they are inserted into the the device is inserted near the iliac crest and the wire comes and it goes into the sacral foramina second or third foramina and that the electrical impulse is on the sacral nerves which keeps on stimulating and they say that there are lots of studies say, stating that they have improved but remember these are extremely expensive and the only a couple of years back only the fda in the united states allowed it to be uh, used on patients uk is also doing it but on still a very very selective basis and if i'm not mistaken each is about 7 to 10000 sterling pounds which is about in sri lankan money of course about 4 million rupees so uh, how it works you can see the gadget here near the iliac crest and then the thing going into the sacral foramina so summary and the take home message first of all find what the patient means by constipation different people have different means for example like patients coming and saying doctor i have gastric from costochondritis to a impending perforation of an artery aneurysm it is gastric so ask them what do you really mean by constipation is it that you don't have the desire to go to the toilet or is it that it comes into your rectum and you want to go but it's not coming out those are the only two things you have to ask then they will say no i don't feel like going so you know it's probably a slow transit if they say no doctor i have the desire but i go and strain and strain and strain i put the finger in and pull it out then only they come out or i have to put the finger in somewhere else and push the wall back then only it comes or you know it's obstructive defecation so ask a few questions if it is less than 3 months always think of a mechanical obstruction in a patient who is over 40 45 years because missing a malignancy is a crime especially a young patient i'm not saying old people you can uh, 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 neglect and miss but especially a young patient if it is over 3 months think is it slow transit type or obstructive defecation exclude the psychosomatic illness before embarking on sophisticated and expensive investigation especially children they may be having problems at home when father and mother start fighting if it's a broken family the first thing child gets is abdominal pain and they don't go to the constipation uh, to uh, the toilet then it becomes a vicious cycle there is fecal retention then fecal discharge because you get overflow discharge overflow incontinence and especially i have seen several children doctors have done every single investigation good money for the doctor without even asking about the background we few see a child coming only with the mother all the time there is some problem at home because these are things you will learn with time or when a child falls sick mother and father both would come with the child may not come in the on the first instance but later on when they keep on coming for other investigation with reports both will come but three four five times they come with the child the child has had the appendicectomy also and then the child has had the endoscopy colonoscopy barium enema ct abdomen you only have to ask the mother where where is the father they will always come out and says doctor we are separated and for the child to see the father the only opportunity is fall sick and the doctors very gladly admit them because money for them <clears throat> then the father also comes to see the child so remember you have to know a little bit of psychosomatic aspects also when you are treating human beings then a thorough clinical examination including a digital rectal examination is a must you may be a medical gastroenterologist 
who is averse to feces, but then you shouldn't be doing gastroenterology. Put a finger in, please. You will find rock hard fecal matter. You know there is something wrong. No point in giving them a laxative like cremafin or something which won't even touch those rocks. Then most patients need only reassurance and lifestyle modification. Really speaking, these should be done by the primary care physician, this is the general practitioner. Thank you. I think incontinence actually, I was going to say at the very beginning, should be for another day because you can't finish incontinence and constipation in one day and a lecture going beyond I mean, uh, 45 minutes, no one will be interested to listen. So is that okay? I mean, I leave incontinence for a difference, another day. Yes? yes, sir. So I can see some questions. What are the... Now oh, there are people called uh, anonymous... Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Constipation. So if you have a... a... <laughs> Uh, there are some uh, questions uh, if you have time uh... yeah yeah no I, I have time i'm just seeing anonymous yeah. attendee yes uh, so, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> or maybe that now I, can you see now these the same thing that happens with the patients they don't want to tell things until they ask so this anonymous attendee might be having the same problem so that is how I look at it. When a patient comes, until you ask, they won't tell you. So the anonymous attendee indications to do colon transit time is that if the patient has symptoms suggestive of slow transit, that is the patient says, doctor, I don't have the desire to go to the toilet. And you do the basic investigations TSH, T3, T4, if you want, serum calcium and a fasting blood sugar. And then if they are abnormal, you really don't have to do the colon transit time. If they are not, if they are normal, but the symptoms are suggestive of slow transit, do it. Then that you will have a, an investigation to confirm that it is a slow transit time. Of throat transit uh, uh, constipation and start training uh, and treating. Then another one, use a Gmail. Do we have to stop laxative? Of course, yes. If the patient is dependent on laxatives, chaturanga, you have to stop. Otherwise, I always ask them before I give, I ask them, are you on laxative? If they say yes, I tell them, okay, stop laxatives for a week. And then come back, I will get you to follow these capsules. And these capsules, make sure they swallow in front of you. I get the nurses to make the two capsules. I ask them first, I put them into empty uh, amoxicillin capsules, 500 milligram capsules. They got a body over the bag. I ask them whether they're allergic to any penicillins, otherwise you get give them that this and they get some reaction, you are in trouble. Then you get some other capsule, maybe uh, uh, omiprazole capsules or whatever, empty it and give it. But stop it for a week and then give it and tell them don't take laxatives during this period. Because if you take laxatives, it's going to uh, give a wrong impression about your transits. Yes. When and how, then there's another no, same anonymous attendee. <laughs> it's like Veswalagat Minima Ruik. Uh, can you please advise when and how it is appropriate to use Tukalapride? When to give? What dose? I must tell you, this, this thing has come to the market only recently. So you first start with your normal metaclopamide or whatever, and then I haven't used it yet, to be honest. I have seen some others using it. If I'm not mistaken, Sanjeeva will, I think, tell me, isn't it about two milligrams? Uh, yes, sir. You, you, can, you usually start with one milligram 
yeah. uh, once a day, and you can increase that to two milligrams. You generally don't go above two. So there two are milligrams four, per day. That is something you, I mean, try not to give, because otherwise they get used to the medications also. So one to two milligrams a day. I haven't used it. I know it's being used by lots of physicians. Uh, which patient do you say to take hard or of fiber, certain things like jackfruit cause of... All right. Now, <clears throat> remember, if your patient has got... Now, this is what I forgot to tell you at the beginning. When you take the history, if you think it is slow transit, and or if it is find out whether it's evacuatory problem, defecation, what do you call it? Obstructed defecation. Now, for a patient with obstructed defecation, you give a high fiber diet, saying that uh, constipation means no fiber, and you give the fiber. He will form a bigger bolus of fecal matter, which he can't even explode and put it out, take it out. So you have to, that is why history is important. Please remember, seeing a patient is not just half a second. If you are having a patient with constipation, try to find out is whether it's a drug inducing or psychological introduce induced thing, or whether it's a slow transit, or whether it is obstructed defecation. So if you have got an obstructed defecation patient who can't even evacuate the normal feces and you give, go and give them jackfruit, he will have a fecal bolus of the size of a jackfruit. So therefore, Try not to give high fiber diet to a person with obstructed defecation. It's counterproductive. It's make, going to make your patient's symptom worse. What can we do to spinal cord injury? Manual evacuation, regular enemas. Now, these patients, I mean, unfortunately, in our country, people who are paralyzed, people who are demented, I mean, I'm sad to say they don't get proper attention because they become a burden to the unit or they keep on coming. These patients have got a specialized care units in other countries where they are taught how to have a bubble evacuation. They are given sort of training about massaging the abdomen where they, you get mass contractions, which will sort of expel the feces. And there are various means and ways and means of doing it. But in our country, what I suggest is, if there are surgeons who are listening, because normally it's the surgeons who get these patients, the neurosurgery unit, they send them to us. Initially, you have to do a manual evacuation. Any mass, you can't be doing it every day, no. So most of the time, once you evacuate the bowel, they will need a colostomy, defunctioning colostomy. And that also will prevent this patient's bed source or pressure source from getting worse. Normally, they are sent to us when they develop bed source and when the fecal matter contaminate them plastic surgeons send them to us saying, can you do a colostomy? So they will need initial evacuation, manual evacuation, and then a colostomy. And that colostomy also, please remember, do it in the area which is sensitive, unless the entire abdomen is high spinal cord transection. Generally it is, you can get a sensitive area above the umbilicus. Don't do the colostomy in an insensitive area because patient will not be able to feel any complications such as cellulitis or obstruction. So therefore do it in an area which is sensitive and don't do a end colostomy, do a loop colostomy. So that even if things collect, in the distal segment, you can even put some enemas through the distal opening of the colostomy to clear the distal segment. What is best to do for solitary rectal in who digitate? 
Now, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome is a disease by itself. You can't sort of discuss the solitary rectal ulcer syndrome in one in a few minutes. I think if you look at the, if you need the psychologist, you need the stoma care or rectal, what you call, they, they have a separate name for those specialists, those nurses. <clears throat> then you have the gastroenterologist and then you have the colorectal surgeon. So initial management will be medical, but make sure you exclude a malignancy in an old person and confirm it. You may need a rectopexy if there is an internal intersusception coming and blocking it and the reason for the solitary rectal ulcer. Or some people very rarely undergo an anterior resection. But remember, there is always something supratentorial in these people. They are obsessed in digitating their rectums. I have had one patient, whatever you say, he says, doctor, until I put the finger in and pull it out, it won't come out. So in our setup, it's very difficult in an outpatient clinic to, or even in the private sector, we need to have GI psychologists. Now, places like St. Mark's, those who have gone there, we know they have psychologists and psychiatrists, both managing. So management of a solitary rectal ulcer is not just the surgeon. Surgeon is there when everything fails to do a surgical procedure, but that also, I would say 70, 80% would fail. They'll keep on coming. They'll keep on digitating. So it is something that you have to look up, look and read. It's quite a, I mean, if you take a textbook, sometimes there are chapters on solitary rectal ulcer. Surgeon comes in last. It's a gastroenterologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, bubble care nurse who have to look after them. Then we go to, I think that's all. No, oh, no, sir, when you, right, so somebody has asked when you decide dynamic pelvic MRI, that again, when you are thinking, when you have got a patient who has got symptoms of obstructed defecation and you have excluded something like congenital hypertrophy or any other rectal lesions, then you go for a pelvic MRI to confirm it. But we, you, I think there was a radiologist who was at Lanka Hospital in the private sector, an Indian person earlier. I don't know whether they are doing it there, but most of the other hospitals, they, they do, but it's not very, I mean, unless you are in a specialized unit as a specialist radiologist. Now, if you go to Edinburgh or St. Mark's or those places where they have specialist colorectal hospitals, they have got a specialist radiologist doing only that, specialist histopathologist doing only that, psychologist doing only that, psychiatrist doing only that, surgeons doing only that. So their interpretations are much more accurate. So we can't blame our radiologists because how often do they get an opportunity to do a dynamic pelvic MRI? I don't think there is anyone doing in the private sector now. Sanjeeva might be able to tell us, I know the hospital I, that I practice, they don't do for this obstructed defecation. No, so even I'm also not aware of, uh, even in the private sector, who has an interest in that aspect. Okay, then I, today I will do the incontinence uh, on another day because that's a topic by itself. <clears throat> So on behalf of the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Nandeva Samsekar uh, for taking up this uh, opportunity and uh, going into the very depths of constipation. Uh, thank you, sir. Maybe we'll invite you again on another day for the part uh, where we can touch up on the incontinence. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think it's a fecal subject that you gave me, but hope you all learn something from it. Because don't neglect the top end and the rear end. Both are equally important. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.